All right. They're going to ask you to start off by telling me your name, where you live, and what you do. <clears throat> My name is Lee Jackson. I live in Dallas and Denton, and I'm the chancellor of the University of North Texas System. Are you a native Dallasite? I was born in Austin. I came to Dallas when I was a couple of months old. So what is it that you like about Texas that keeps you there? Well, I like having a sense of place, and for me, um, this is the only place that feels like home. It's not the most beautiful place in the world uh, at times, but it's home, and I'm one of those people that feels better when I'm connected to my roots. When you were growing up, were you familiar at all with the Dealey family? And, uh... No. I grew up in Oak Cliff. Uh, my father was a, an accountant and a corporate employee. My mother was a school teacher. They were not civically or politically active, and we didn't live in the politically active part of town. Uh, we lived in a really nice middle-class area, pretty far from the circles of influence in Dallas, and I didn't really know anything about the structure or the leadership of Dallas at the time. Where did you go to your higher education? I went from Dallas to Duke um, and got my bachelor's degree at uh, Duke University and then a master's degree in public administration at SMU, what was a city management professional training program, really. And what uh, kind of positions did you hold there before the Dallas County Judge? Well, I started w while I was at SMU with an internship in the city manager's office. So starting in August of 1971, I was an assistant to the Dallas city manager. I did that for three years. Uh, then I ran a congressional campaign when I wanted to learn more about electoral politics. I worked for a congressman. Uh, and then in 1975, I went to Austin and worked for a state representative. And in 1976, I ran for and was elected to the Texas House of Representatives. So for 10 years, I served in the Texas House of Representatives and then 16 years as county judge. And you've been a uh, Republican or a Democrat? And I was a Republican uh, all those elected years. Well, let's see, they're two separate stories. Um, when other young boys in Oak Cliff wanted to play for the Dallas Cowboys, uh, I wanted to be President of the United States. Now, that dates back to pretty early in my life, so I can't say exactly what caused me to have that ambition. I think it was in part a process of elimination. Everyone else seemed to know exactly what they wanted. They wanted to be a doctor or an athlete, and I didn't have any uh, discernible talent, um, except I was interested in words and ideas and in history. I read a lot, and I think at some crucial formative years I saw Lyndon Johnson on television and uh, thought I could do better than that because he wasn't a very good speaker. Um, so that led me to have an interest in government. I, I, I read uh, books about government when I was young and just somehow always knew that that's what I was going to try to uh, make into a career. And later when I heard about city management, I, it was the first time I knew about professionals, that there actually were trained managers who worked in state and local government just the way there are people who get a business degree. So I had that interest in government from a pretty early age. I didn't have any particular uh, political philosophy. I didn't know anything about liberals or conservatives or socialism or capitalism, uh, but I was interested in, in how we govern ourselves in a democracy. Uh, I, I actually think that much of my political philosophy was f formed when I, I read uh, Ayn Rand uh, and her novels. And for a time, a very short time, I was infatuated with her very individualistic philosophy. Uh, but then I read Edmund Burke and saw a different kind of uh, traditional or conservative philosophy, a more community-oriented and historically rooted philosophy and I became a different kind of a conservative, but somewhere in that process uh, I became a Republican. Um, I do remember in 1964 being impressed with Barry Goldwater as a person of integrity. Almost everyone said he was a person of integrity, even those who didn't agree with his philosophy. And to me at age 14, integrity seemed to be very, very important. I couldn't understand why you would be, uh, why you would support someone for government leadership who was considered manipulative, devious, cynical, 
perhaps not honest, over someone who everyone agreed was a person of great honesty and integrity. It was only later in life that I found there were actually issues that, that played into these elections as well as personal characteristics. So, uh, Barry Goldwater was probably the first uh, Republican that I knew of who had some redeeming features. There just weren't elected Republicans in 1964 in Texas. Um, a couple of years later, I helped as a high school student uh, support John Tower for the United States Senate in Texas. He was also someone who was very well thought of. He was a college professor, extremely bright, and he was, uh, by Texas standards then, a maverick. He was running against the political establishment of Texas, which to me as a 16-year-old was very appealing. So after Goldwater and Tower, I was uh, by then self-identified as a Republican. Nope, I don't care who it is. They can ring all day, I'm not going to get it. It must be somebody dialing direct because I don't believe my staff would be doing this to me while I'm mic'd and can't get out of this chair. Okay. Um, can you tell me what you thought of President Kennedy before his assassination, what your impressions were at the time? Well, as I say, 1964 is really my first political memory. It seems odd to say it, but I don't recall having any um, awareness of, of President Kennedy. Uh, I was 13 uh, at the time of the assassination. Um, I was in junior high school in Dallas. It was a powerful uh, event uh, when it happened and there were a lot of ramifications but really up to that point I don't remember having a, a political philosophy or really any awareness of him as president. My parents didn't talk about him over the dinner table. I just had no awareness of it. Well, I was, as I say, I was 13 years old. I was in the eighth or the ninth grade. Um, I think I was in algebra class when they first came on the loudspeaker at school and, and announced that, uh, and, and of course some of our classmates were downtown. There were some people who knew the president was in town and some people had gone down with their families to see him. It wasn't a big thing, but we were aware it was happening that day and they came on with a report that there's been some kind of an accident or some kind of a disturbance and it's not been confirmed. Uh, well, it wasn't presented as anything very conclusive and I don't think, like most young teenagers, most people took it very seriously at that point. It was really, as I remember it, a second announcement shortly thereafter, maybe 15 minutes, a half an hour, that, that did come on and confirm that uh, the president had been injured, wounded, I'm, I don't remember the exact words, that uh, students who wanted to leave school would be allowed to leave school, uh, and that families in some cases were coming to get the students, and I think we were asked to put our heads on our desk and have a period of silence. Uh, all teaching stopped, and at that point, with the second announcement, the, the tenor of the school day changed. It was all of a sudden a, a different kind of event than anyone had uh, ever experienced. It was really not that day but pretty shortly thereafter that being in Dallas became a part of the experience. I, I suspect the first announcement was just about the same for school kids all across the country. Uh, you somehow knew, even if you didn't understand any of the details, that some awful historical event had happened and it didn't matter where you were located. Uh, in, the, in the days that, that it followed, uh, Dallas was aware that it was in the spotlight and there were a lot of people second-guessing the security, the skills of the Dallas police, the political climate in Dallas. Um, Dallas, the city of hate, was a term that was then 
you know, put forward nationally, and I, I think even to to children, we we understood that this was not only something awful, but it was somehow a part of our city and our community was different because it was we were the the city where it happened. We were now a part of the story, and I don't remember having a lot of thoughts about that, but I was certainly aware of it. And then somehow, when when Jack Ruby was shot, not that many days later. Um, I actually remember seeing that with my family watching television, and as did many people across the country, except that you knew it was happening 10 miles away from where you were watching, and it was once again a reflection on your local police department and your local community. So it was a, a very odd period. You said you grew up in Oak Cliff. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I mean, for the rest of my years in Oak Cliff, and, and I lived there uh, another four years until I went to college, um, there were connections to the incident that would pop up from time to time. The, uh, the officer who was um, shot by Oswald, Officer Tippett, uh, had a son who attended our school. Uh, the movie theater that Oswald had ducked into uh, for a while in the middle of the day, the Texas Theater on Jefferson, was a theater that some of us uh, went to later uh, by the time I was in high school. I don't know what kind of films they showed in 1963, but in 1965 and 6, it was the closest thing we had to an art house. So I went there to see movies like Tom Jones, which was considered a very risque movie and the Texas Theater was the only place that it was shown so anytime you went to the Texas Theater you you remembered not that there was any plaque or anything at the time but you knew that this was the infamous uh, Texas Theater. I don't remember driving by the school book depository or going up and down the, through the triple underpass and and making a you know a special site out of that that was not somewhere where I went as a uh, as a kid, I didn't go into downtown Dallas. My father and mother didn't work in downtown Dallas. Um, but certainly in Oak Cliff, we had a few connections to the events. So uh, looking back now and being politically aware, what are your thoughts on President Kennedy? Oh, I'm getting ready to read the newest uh, Robert Dalek uh, biography, uh, An Unfinished Life, I think it is, An Unfinished Something. Um, I have uh, ambivalent uh, feelings about uh, John Kennedy uh, other than the fact that he was uh, uh, very different than many recent U.S. presidents. He was well ec educated from a, uh, as close to an aristocracy as this country has uh, from a section of the country that's always been considered uh, the intellectual leading region in, in New England and was handsome and had an attractive family. Other than that, um, I think his, his record was very mixed and there's a lot to disagree with. Uh, as a Republican and a conservative, there are a number of things I can look back and say I probably wouldn't have agreed with John Kennedy on had I been of uh, voting age at the time. On the other hand, by today's standards, uh, he was uh, uh, much more conservative on many issues, uh, much more aggressive on international defense issues than many of his successors are in the Democratic Party today and so there's some things that Republicans uh, look back to and and, and think that uh, John Kennedy was their kind of, of Democrat by modern standards. Uh, you know, he's an interesting man with an interesting family and a lot of challenges and it would have been fascinating to see how he dealt with uh, all of the uh, issues after the the first hundred days and after the honeymoon and after you know, that first period of his presidency, it, for most presidents, gets much harder uh, in the second term. Uh, and, you know, we'll never know because of uh, his presidency was frozen uh, in that moment, just as our image of him as a young man is frozen uh, at that age. Do you have any speculation on what the world might be like if he had lived? No. Well, only on one uh, very notable uh, occasion. In the summer of 1964, my Boy Scout troop 
sent delegates to the National Scout Jamboree, uh, which is held in, or was then held in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Um, thousands of Boy Scouts camp out in tents in this large uh, park and have three or four days of activities. Well, for us in Dallas and in Oak Cliff in particular, it was a very big deal. You didn't fly readily back then. The rates weren't as reasonable and people didn't, didn't fly every weekend. Uh, I'd never flown anywhere. <clears throat> so I'd never been to Washington, never been to Philadelphia, never been to New York, and we organized a a tour basically in which we we flew to Washington, took a bus around, drove up to Philadelphia, looked at historic sites, and went into New York City for a day. And at several points on that tour we were, um, you know, shunned would be a strong word, but we received negative reaction because we were in scout uniforms that had our troop number and the name of our city on our right shoulder. So the patch said Troop 525, Dallas, Texas. And when 20 or 30 boys go walking down the street with Dallas, Texas on their sh shoulders, particularly when you're in a, a military-like uniform uh, and you're from Dallas, Texas in 1964, there were people who crossed the street uh, and made various expressions of disgust, some of them profane. No one hit us or attacked us or whatever, but we actually went to counseling before we went on this trip. That is, the Boy Scouts sponsored a preparation for the trip in which some kind of a counselor was brought in to visit with our parents and with us to point out to us that you're probably going to receive some comment about being from Dallas. Uh, the rest of the country is, is angry and Dallas to some degree bears the weight of this and, and so you better be prepared for it. I don't remember what was said in the program, I just remember how <clears throat> what an eye-opener it was and, and really appropriate because it did happen a little bit and it was better that we were prepared. So that's the only time that I remember. I, uh, we were not hosting uh, a stream of uh, visiting business people uh, in our home in Oak Cliff. I don't remember coming in contact with people outside the region during those years except on that one trip. So, uh, you know, on the one trip I did realize that what I had heard that the rest of the country had a um, concern about Dallas and an anger that in part was directed at Dallas was in fact true to some degree. It, it existed and we experienced it and it helped me understand that a little bit. I think it's just time. I don't think there's really anything you you can do about that. Now, you can certainly avoid uh, doing dumb things, um, and it was important that Dallas recognize that history happened. It it did it in a very limited way with the uh, fundraising that made possible the Kennedy Cenotaph downtown, uh, and thanks to the help of Stanley Marcus and others. Um, the group that raised the funds for that cenotaph sought the informal advice of the of the Kennedy family about an architect, uh, retained Philip Johnson, and built a memorial, probably not in the location that Philip Johnson or the family would have originally chosen, but they did build a memorial that was considered uh, a, a an appropriate uh, and sober and distinguished piece of architecture. Now most people in Dallas found it cold and unexpressive and and bizarre and in fact a lot of visitors made fun of it and said well you know Dallas couldn't even put up a good statue they had to put up this box and it was probably a little hard for the people at the time to explain well we didn't really choose this we tried to do what others suggested was the right kind of architecture and whether it's worn the uh, you know, met the test of time or not, I'll, I'll leave to others. But Dallas did that and tried to respond. Um, I forgot, what was your question? Just how, what made Dallas this image? Oh, yeah, the end. Um, well, Eric Johnson was elected mayor shortly thereafter and was not a native Texan, was uh, from a really different background, one of the founders of Texas Instruments, 
I moved the company there from New Jersey. He had a Scandinavian American background, had very high academic standards, and as a result had very high standards for Dallas, the city to which he had helped transplant this corporation, which was going to be a global corporation, again very unusual for Dallas. So uh, some people saw in the election of Eric Johnson a deliberate decision on the part of Dallas voters to break from the past and be more progressive, be, uh, seek to compete on a larger uh, playing field. I don't know if that was really a factor in the election. I was not a participant or aware of it at the time. It certainly is one of the results, though, that because Eric Johnson saw things on a larger scale, he more than any person promoted DFW Airport, and DFW Airport probably as much as any one factor helped change the image of Dallas. For one thing, it gave people a reason to come through here uh, on their way to a lot of places. It gave businesses a reason to relocate here and greatly expanded the international business in the region. So Dallas was not just another sleepy southern town that happened to be the site where a climate of, of provincialism and hate and negative politics had created the environment that enabled the assassination of a president. Dallas became uh, like Atlanta, uh, a city that was bigger than its region and that had a lot more going for it. And people over time put things in perspective that, that the assassination happened in Dallas the same way that the assassination of Robert Kennedy happened in a hotel in Los Angeles. And maybe, maybe they acknowledged over time it didn't really have anything to do with the city itself. Can you explain to me what the Dallas County judge position actually is? Well, every state has some provision for uh, county government. Counties, in most cases, carry out the laws of the state in running the courts and operating the jails and public hospitals. Some states uh, elect a county commission and they elect their presiding officer. Some states have a county executive in which someone is actually hired as a professional to run the business affairs. Texas has uh, an unusual system in which every county has a five-member governing body. Four county commissioners are elected from districts and they have some road and bridge duties as well as sitting on the five-member commission that adopts the tax rate and runs the county government. And the fifth member of the commissioner's court is elected countywide, has the title of county judge because it is a historic title in Texas. And in the old days, the county judge was the only type of judicial authority. There were no uh, lawyers, no specialized courts, but you had a person designated in a, in a farming area in the 19th century to be the county judge and to hold court on, on small matters that weren't big enough to go to state court. Over time, the county judge title still exists, but the jobs are completely different in the biggest counties of the state. It's, it is like being mayor of the county. It presides over the commissioner's court provides leadership on major issues, serves on a lot of committees and boards, and represents the county in doing business, signing contracts and building buildings and all those sorts of things. So Dallas County has uh, about 5,000 employees, a $400 million budget. They operate the Park, Parkland Hospital, the hospital, ironically, whose emergency room received uh, John Kennedy before he died. Uh, they operate the jail, not the one in which uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was shot. That was a city jail, but now we have a city-county combined jail that the county operates. The city's no longer in the jail business, and Dallas County operates it. We operate the juvenile delinquency system, the mental health system, and, uh, and a lot of other miscellaneous government services. And what made you run for that office? Well, I was, I was in the state legislature. I had begun as a single man of 26 and the state legislature is a very part-time job and after 10 years I had a family, a wife and two children and couldn't do that anymore and I'd already announced that I was going to retire when our county judge um, announced he wasn't going to run for election. And, uh, I had actually written my college uh, uh, term paper on the Dallas County budget. I had more interest in and knowledge of county government than most people because it's considered a sort of forgotten level of government. A lot of people are interested in cities because they get all the glamour and the attention or they want to go to Washington, but the counties are pretty well forgotten, but I always thought it was an interesting hands-on level of government that did a lot of direct services. 
didn't make a lot of policy, so it wasn't maybe as philosophically exciting, but if you look at mental health and health care and roads and elections and operation of the courts, it has a lot to do with the quality of life, uh, I, I still think. So it was a very interesting position, and I thought I had a reasonable chance of winning, having um, had some success in the state legislature, and there weren't too many other people getting ready to run, so I, I got into the race quickly. And uh, once, you, once you got elected, when did you decide to support the creation of the museum? Well, it wasn't an issue in my campaign. It wasn't the sort of thing that was glamorous enough or important enough to make a major plank in a, in a campaign, but uh, I knew about the project. I just didn't know very much about it. Um, I was elected in early November and started immediately going down to uh, the building where the county commissioner's court meets for their regular weekly meetings. And I would spend a little time in the building after the meetings. I would visit some of the offices and I was doing my homework about county government. And it struck me from the first day that I went there for my first commissioner's court meeting that there were people milling around outside the building. And some of them would come into the building there were signs posted on all the doors uh, and at the elevators, no access to the sixth floor. Uh, and yet people didn't believe what they read. They couldn't believe there was no way to get to the sixth floor. They just assumed it was only for special people. So they would come inside, ask the uh, people at each desk, well, what's the real way that you get to the sixth floor? And they were told, well, no, it's locked. Uh, there's nothing on the sixth floor. It's locked up. They would say, thank you very much and they would go over to the fire stairs and go in and try to go up to the sixth floor. Uh, sometimes they would get locked in the fire stairs and people would have to let them out. So it struck me as a very odd situation and so I asked more about it and found that there were in fact plans. The plans had been stalled. Uh, a group of citizens had formed a nonprofit organization, had raised some money and had engaged some planners to, to create a vision of what could be done on the sixth floor with about three and a half million dollars. But they had not been able to get very close to raising three and a half million dollars. Um, it was just not a high priority. There were not that many people in 1986 who were, who were vigorously opposed to doing some kind of a memorial or a Kennedy Museum. But there were also not very many people that ranked it as a high priority for their philanthropic activities. So they had raised a few hundred thousand dollars, a little bit less than a million, and we're not anywhere near three and a half million. I felt like it was a problem um, that needed a solution because you couldn't work in that building and not see that on a daily basis something was wrong. People were coming from around the world. Uh, it was truly the most international group of visitors that you could ever imagine at any sort of a tourist attraction because there would be people from all of the United States and countries, uh, business visitors, uh, Japanese business and would pull up in a taxi or a limousine, it would stop, they would all get out, point their cameras, jump back in the limousine and go off to the airport. Uh, American families on tour would get off of the interstate highway, ask directions where that building is, they would park nearby and come walk around the building, go inside, stand outside and pose for pictures uh, with you know, their family in the foreground and the building in the background ask everyone concerned, where can I go to find some information and basically be told, well, we're sorry, there's not any information, it's just a building. Um, didn't seem to me that that should be allowed to go on and if I could think of a way to solve it, I, I, I wanted to do that. And so what I proposed was that if my colleagues on the commissioner's court were supportive and we could come up with a way to finance the improvements without extending the county's credit, that is without committing funds that otherwise were needed for jails or courts or hospitals and if the exhibit could operate successfully and repay that as a loan then we would help build the physical improvements. It required a separate visitor center and a separate elevator uh, and then some significant improvements to actually install the exhibit and we would propose to build the building for a couple of million dollars if the nonprofit group could raise at least a million dollars to put in the exhibit itself. So they could own the materials. We wouldn't have to be put in a position of the county government owning historical memorabilia or taking editorial control of the content. We could bless the project, approve it, help provide space for it, get repaid for the investment of building it, but not actually have to operate it. 
And that's the plan that, that we eventually came up with. Now, I didn't know that, I didn't know all the details on the day I was sworn in, but early in January of 1987, I think it was on January the 2nd of 1987, I was sworn in as county judge and gave a short address and said that day that one of my goals, in addition to balancing the budget and improving county services, would be to find a solution to this sixth floor issue and, and at least and at last complete the project as it had been uh, designed. And those who had worked on it for, um, at that point, over 10 years, um, you know, they, they really didn't get the plan fully crystallized until sometime in the, in the late 70s, I think. But it had been developed and then been stalled for quite a while. So they were heartened that something might be possible and we started meeting and I met with the financial advisors to the county and the bond lawyers and the other people to figure out if there was a way to issue a certain kind of, of debt instrument that we could retire through payments from the exhibit and we worked all that out really within a few months and got the project uh, underway and went through all the interesting architectural uh, experiences. We had a private group coming inside our office building filling out a floor and we had to decide how much of the cost of the building they would share and repairs to the roof and the structure and a lot of other issues. So it was a interesting first major building project for me as county judge and, and a unique one. Uh, and I think it's been uh, very successful in doing just what I wanted it to do. Uh, I'm not a museum expert, but my impression has always been that it, it was done thoroughly and tastefully and fairly and that it, most importantly of all, it met the needs of the people who come here. That whether you come from Waxahachie uh, or Stockholm, if this is your one chance to be in Dallas and you want to come here and, and feel some completion that you can see the the site in context, you can learn about the history, you can see how people felt and learn about the times, that that exhibit provides more than just the, the gruesome ballistics uh, exhibit that some people expect. Now there are people who want uh, to delve into conspiracy theories and ballistics a lot more and they go on and specialize in the area, but to provide a broad overview, giving all the theories without being too partisan one way or the other about which theory is right, I think it's done a really excellent job and it's satisfied uh, the need and it's become really more successful than, than I could have envisioned. There was a concern that after the initial years that with every passing generation the memory of the events would, would fade and that attendance would slowly decline and it would end up being a liability that somehow it couldn't uh, pay its staff and keep the doors open and refurbish the exhibits and maintain its currency but instead it's done uh, just the opposite. It's, it's had to evolve a little bit to do it. It's, the exhibit has, has grown beyond the original boundaries. It does now have some collections of archival material and memorabilia that were not originally envisioned. Uh, it's now hosting events and art exhibits that are uh, tangential to the original events of November of 1963, but so far nothing's been done that I, I know of that's not been uh, appropriate and that's in fact helped build an audience for the history that's at the core of the uh, museum. So did the county have any kind of editorial say over what happened in the museum or did they just put them on? Yes, um, we did have uh, a considerable amount of informal um, um, editorial oversight of, of what didn't go into the museum, maybe more than, than what did. Um, the designers of the exhibit, uh, Staples and Charles, uh, a firm out of Washington, D.C., made a, a variety of proposals, stages of proposals of the scope of what would be in the exhibit, and we were briefed on those, and had there been, um, let's say, a uh, um, a dominance of the exhibit by uh, materials speculating about all the different theories and had that been the only content of the exhibit I think there would have been disappointment. Uh, not that there was a sense that there were there were things that shouldn't be presented but just you only had so much space and you could either make it into the conspiracy museum which later became a private uh, 
activity elsewhere in Dallas because there's plenty of room for all the books and the ideas that have developed over the years, but that really wasn't what this site was envisioned uh, to be. So we were made aware of what was being planned and we had the opportunity to raise questions. Uh, we didn't write the script or select the materials or edit the videos, um, but we were, we were kept informed about how it was developed. I don't know. I don't remember anything that uh, um, was a real problem. Uh, I I took an active personal interest in uh, the copy because I was curious about how the curator and consultants would approach all the various sensitive points. How do you present the criticism of Dallas in Dallas? in a way that's historically fair because it has to be presented and yet also uh, present what what Dallas would consider uh, its response or rejoinder to those criticisms and not look like you were creating a biased exhibit in favor of the hometown. You know, how, do you, how do you present the multiple conspiracy theories briefly without choosing one over the other? How do you present the Warren Commission report in a way that helps everyone understand what it was without going to great lengths to endorse it or reject it or you know, build a greater controversy as a part of the exhibit, which wasn't its purpose. And I, I, I did review really all the initial panels and copy and draft for the wall boards, not, not all the video and things like that, but I, I looked at a lot of the major exhibits and probably made some editorial suggestions, but I don't remember anything that was any real um, controversy over content. They knew the kind of middle ground they were aiming at and I thought they did a very professional job of, of hitting the mark. Sure. How long do you think we'll be, by the way? Or 30 if I keep talking so much. What uh, made you leave the position of county judge and come here? Oh, I announced in the fall of 2001 that four terms was uh, going to be enough, 16 years was enough, and uh, I did not use the cliche that I've accomplished everything I wanted to do because uh, there were always new projects. There, there are things going on right now. Uh, Jerry Jones and the Dallas Cowboys have approached the county about building a massive new football stadium entertainment arena and they had talked to me about that before I left. Uh, the county's working on building a new civil courts building, uh, have air quality issues. There were a lot of things I'd worked out on that weren't finished or that would have been exciting but uh, to me at least there came a point where you're used to waking up uh, w with excitement going down to the office and enjoying all the new challenges and finally after 16 years I just didn't feel like I was 100% challenged. I was maybe only 90% challenged and so that to me was a signal it was time to find something different to do. And how did you find this? I didn't really. This found me. I, I announced in, in November of 2001 that I would not be running for re-election and for the next four months uh, I had about 30 different uh, proposals. Now some of them were very informal. A friend might say, well have you ever thought about so-and-so? I talked to so-and-so. Uh, I had people call me and say our board was talking about needing a new head of this foundation or of this hospital or of this project. And I, So I had different things that people talked to me. They wanted to know what I was thinking about and I told them I really wanted something that involved at least partial responsibility for running an organization. I, I was approached as political people probably always are about being a mouthpiece for various organizations. Basically being a public relations spokesman uh, because they assume that if you're good at giving speeches or you're comfortable working in the public arena that you would like that that job. And, th and there are some of those things that are very interesting. I just knew that it wasn't really exactly what I wanted. I wanted to, even though it's a lot harder to have administrative responsibility, I wanted to be in a position that had some budget and staffing responsibility for actually 
delivering projects for helping make an organization better. And of all the organizations that contacted me, this was the job that was most meaningful, that I felt like I could do the most good, that I would have the most responsibility, uh, and that might be the hardest. And it's proven pretty challenging so far. Do you think you'll ever run for public office again? I have no plans to, and I know that sounds coy. Uh, it's just why I say the word never. Uh, most of the time when a political person says that they're beating down his or her door to get them to run for a political office, it's usually the person, you know, leaning out the window knocking on their own door. They want to hear it. They hear it because they want to hear it. So I really don't have any appetite for running for office again. It was hard and grueling, and I got a lot of satisfaction out of it. I did it for 26 years. Um, had I wanted to be governor or do those sort of things, I guess I would have planned and already tried to do that. I always told people if I lived in Rhode Island, I would have already run for governor. But in Texas, you've got to be independently wealthy or be willing to spend two or three years on the road. And I long ago lost the appetite for that kind of thing. So maybe something would happen someday, but it's not my current plan. I hope to enjoy this job as much as I enjoy being county judge. That doesn't mean I'll stay here 16 years, but if I could get as much enjoyment out of being a leader in a large university system as I did in county government, I would, I'd be happy to feel like I was productive and to work at it for a long time. Can you tell me about the plans you're telling me before about moving the memorial and what kind of was left unfinished? Well, uh, downtown Dallas has not finished uh, evolving. Uh, we have a World War II era downtown uh, with an old-fashioned street grid system, a lot of buildings from the 50s and early 60s, some of them vacant, and there's a sense of expectancy that something different is going to be happening in downtown Dallas. We've added a lot of housing around the periphery, but the core uh, in the downtown Dallas business district is still a lot of empty buildings. So the county has suggested that we'd like to revitalize the southwest end of downtown and do some things different. We'd like to take the two blocks that are in front of the, the county courthouses divided by Elm, Main, and Commerce and make them into a grander park to, to treat that whole space as a plaza and rearrange what's, what's out there now. We have a historic cabin, the John Neely Bryan cabin, that's not in its original location and it was not really John Neely Bryan's cabin. But that's fine, it's still a, a pretty neat 19th century uh, uh, hewn log cabin and it could be moved slightly differently on the site and still be very attractive. In a very unimaginative way, we stuck the postage stamp sized cabin right in the middle of one city block with four sidewalks that lead perpendicularly up to the cabin. So you've taken the entire block, cut it up with sidewalks that don't really do much except lead you to the cabin. And in the summer months, it's very hot with a lot of concrete and very little shade. Next to it is a block, also square, with a square building, the Kennedy Cenotaph, stuck exactly in the middle of the block, and again with large, wide concrete sidewalks leading up to the square. So you have two blocks of concrete in the summer that for really dedicated tourists who want to go up and find out what they are, you can do it, but you don't have any um, change in the landscape. You don't have any berms or hills or interesting features. You don't have nice trees, you don't have fountains, you don't have a gazebo, you don't have any picnic seating area, you don't even have historical signage in which you could present a lot of information in two blocks. It's neither a place of beauty, nor a place of history, nor a place of good architecture, nor a place for public events. It's just two blocks dedicated to, to two buildings that do have their historical importance, but they don't have to be there. One of the things that I asked when the proposal first came up to develop this, this area was, is it possible we might close one block of Main Street and create an, a two-block park? One of the issues was, did we have any opportunity to move the Kennedy Cenotaph? Philip Johnson still living, and an approach was made to him to ask how he would feel. And the answer that I received back was that that was not his original site. He thought there should be some sight line between the Cenotaph and the school book depository, and that therefore he would be amenable. Uh, to the extent he was asked to studying ways to move the cenotaph and that he would like he and his firm would like to be consulted so I thought at the right time if the county 
ever receives the opportunity from the city of Dallas to close that one block of Main Street, that they ought to go to Philip Johnson and his firm and get them to come back to Dallas and look at it and help us plan the site in a better way. A better way for visitors, more shade, more seating area, uh, historical information outdoors as well as inside the exhibit, um, better maps of the site, just a lot of things that could be done. Better lighting uh, and fewer cars, if possible, going right through the middle of it. That street, Main Street, carries very little local traffic. It carries some buses, carries some through traffic, but it's not critical to downtown's commercial needs and we could easily close that street and make the whole area much quieter, serve all the same traffic on Elm and Commerce, but it's going to take a lot of work. There are some people who are opposed to closing that block of Main Street and it was one of the things I didn't get finished when, when I was there. I just couldn't get them to agree uh, to let us try an experiment even to close Main Street. But the county does have pretty exciting plans to, even with a divided uh, park with Main Street down the middle, to at least make the features much more attractive and I hope they're able to do that. You mentioned briefly the Conspiracy Museum <laughs> and uh, what do you think of not only the Conspiracy Museum but the vendors who are kind of you know, gathered in this area? Well, I, uh, I've had mixed reactions. I've tried not to have just a knee-jerk um, desire for a government-sponsored monopoly on the information, which is, after all, what some of the conspiracy theories are about. So why reinforce that theory by pretending that there ought to be one source of information on the site? Let history finally judge you know, who really does have evidence on their side. Um, I have always thought that it would be nice if the Sixth Floor Museum and the city and the county wanted to provide more thorough and balanced historical information that they should figure out a way to have a presence out on Dealey Plaza. There should be some kind of information booth or visitors bureau. Now there is a visitors bureau inside the Old Red Courthouse now, but I think for a lot of the pedestrians they don't ever get inside to see that. I'm talking about uh, people in, in uniform or red t-shirts or whatever that would actually be guides might have material available for sale, certainly would have maps, direct people into the Sixth Floor Museum. It would be about as far as I would go in thinking that we, we need to correct the, uh, the presentation on that site. It, it always concerned me that people came to the corner of Elm and Houston and didn't always know that there was a building on the back side of the school book depository that had all this information because we were so subtle in presenting it. it. Unlike any commercial venture, we didn't have flashing neon signs. We didn't have someone out passing two-for-one coupons on the corner. We just had really a pretty subtle arrow that said the sixth floor this way. Well, if you talked to one of the private guides who sold you one of the tabloid newspapers and offered you a sidewalk tour, uh, they may or may not have mentioned that there was a museum on the back side of the building. And you may have gotten back in your car and gone on to Hoboken and never knew that this whole inf information presentation was there. So that was really my only concern. I, I think rather than try to regulate who's on the sidewalk and cut off the vendors, the city and the county ought to get together and have a really more professional plan about how to have good information out there on the sidewalk. And if they do that and people choose and they want to buy the tabloid newspaper or they find it more interesting, then great. Let the marketplace support it over time and you know, let the best tabloid win. Um, How do you see the uh, Sixth Floor Museum in comparison to the Conspiracy Museum? Uh, well, th this will sound critical or, or, or petty. It's really not, but uh, I've never been that interested in the conspiracy theories. Uh, not that I believe the Warren Commission so wholeheartedly that I'm not interested. It's just not one of my historical interests. I haven't taken the time to go and explore it, and therefore I have to confess I've never been in the Conspiracy Museum. Um, it's not a, a uh, block, I hope, on my part. It's just one of those things I never did. So I, I, I don't believe I ever got a complaint about them. I never had someone come and say it's just outrageous that you allow them to be presenting this biased information or whatever. Uh, as far as I can tell, people come to the site with a, with a buyer beware attitude and, and they go seek out whatever they want to seek out. and. Um, they're not complaining to the city or the county or the authorities, quote unquote, 
that somehow they ought to be protected or that, that museum's not good enough. So whether, whether it's a really good, uh, historically accurate presentation of various theories or not, I, I just don't know. Can you tell me a little bit about when Oliver Stone came to town, how that played out in trying to get to... Um, well, we had a couple of uh, breaches of what we thought were our regulations for that building. Uh, it's obviously a special building, and we had countywide policies about filming. Um, and then over time, we developed some special standards for that building because there was so much interest. Uh, we were caught short one weekend when a radio production company got an injunction forcing us to allow Morton Downey to broadcast live from inside the sixth floor. And we had always been able over the years to tell every organization, including CBS, ABC, and the national television news, that you can do a number of things outside you can go through and film footage inside the sixth floor, but you can't do a live show inside because, again, we have people coming from around the world, and this is their only chance in there. And while it's not a, a sanctuary or a religious site, it is very powerful emotionally to a lot of people to have that one experience for an hour and a half, two hours. Therefore, we didn't let anyone in. Well, Morton Downey got, uh, as I remember it, on a Sunday, a judge to issue a restraining order that forced us to let him in the broadcast. So that was breach number one. Um, and then came the Oliver Stone movie production where his production company came to town, talked to our staff, understood the rules, and wanted to enter into an agreement in which they would uh, pay to do certain things. They would rent the seventh floor. They would rent the parking lot outside the building for several months. Uh, they would decorate the building in certain ways and they would pay us a certain amount. Um, I didn't think it was appropriate. I didn't think it was necessary. And I thought that the argument that they needed to physically be inside our building and recreate the sixth floor experience on the seventh floor of the school book depository was absolutely laughable. People film movies all the time about the White House without telling the president to, by the way, would you move out for three months while we film here in the real White House? Otherwise, we can't present the experience of the American presidency. It's just absurd. I thought at the time that what Oliver Stone wanted was notoriety, and he got it, thanks in part to me, because I opposed his request for a, a lease and said they can go in a film studio and create whatever they want that looks like the sixth floor. Since we're not actually going to let him take over the sixth floor itself and spend three months pointing his cameras outside the sixth floor window, it's not going to be the real experience anyway. It's going to be off the roof or the seventh floor or whatever. So why mess our building up? Why disrupt the experience for the visitors? Why make this a movie set for months and months on end? But we had a three to two vote on our five member governing body and I lost was not the only vote I lost over 16 years, but it's one of the ones I remember the most. Uh, it wasn't a philosophical thing necessarily. I just thought it was a bad precedent. If we break our rules for Oliver Stone, and we let him do all sorts of special things, and we did. I don't remember what they were now in detail, but we let him go farther than we had anyone else. I thought, oh, this will come back to haunt us. Everyone's going to want to come here and film various things, and we'll have to let them use the building once we let uh, Oliver Stone use it. I thought we should have said this building of all buildings, while it's not a national memorial or a historic site, it is special and we ought to have a rule that no one attaches anything physically, no one builds anything here. This building is sort of sacrosanct. Well, three on a three to two vote, the court let him have that contract. Uh, the filming went uh, okay. I think they took a little longer maybe, but by and large they, they upheld their contract. But ironically, in my opinion, one of the things I predicted did come true. Right after JFK was filmed, we had a movie called Ruby uh, that came and insisted that they also wanted the building. And this time they wanted to attach some things to the windows. They wanted to take the ground floor windows back to their 1963 look. And in 1963 they had some, some aluminum or concrete um, 
screens that covered all the downstairs windows in a, in a quite elaborate pattern, and they had long since been taken away. Well, they wanted to come put these on with styrofoam and stick them on the windows. And I opposed that contract just out of principle, but I felt some uh, smug justification later when it turned out this company went in in the middle of the night one night without really explaining it to our staff, and after they stuck the styrofoam in the windows, they sprayed carbon black all over them to make them look aged instead of bright white. Well, the carbon black on raw brick just went straight into the bricks of the building. And after they finished the museum, I mean the, the filming, they said, oh, by the way, we can't get the black off of your building. The first floor of this historic site is now defaced by this film company that sprayed carbon black all over our building, which to me made my point that why would we be using this building as a movie set? You know, for reasons like that, go, go off somewhere else and recreate the building. But uh, that's really all I, I remember. I, uh, uh, I didn't pal around with Oliver Stone. Uh, never, don't think I ever met him in the filming. Um, and, and I don't remember any other problems. My, mine was really philosophical. It wasn't a reflection on, on Oliver Stone's quality as a filmmaker or his historical accuracy or, or lack thereof. Uh, I love all kinds of movies, and you know he can make movies that are as provocative as he wants to make them. I just didn't think he needed that building in order to create uh, a sense of historical uh, verisimilitude. Uh, I did not see it in the movie theater, but they brought it, let's see here, yeah, they brought a, uh, a preview uh, to the county and set up a viewing one day in a, in a room, and I, I watched it. What did you think? I don't remember. It was a long time ago. Okay. And uh, you said you never took the time to really go into the conspiracy theories and stuff, but um, you seem to have some trepidation about the warrant. No, no, no. There were obviously the Warren Commission was at the center uh, of the controversy over what kind of history could we present if all we knew was what the Warren Commission had validated, and so it was uh, probably more awkward than than at uh, Ford's Theater in Washington about which series of events do you present as the basic story uh, of the exhibit, and they they presented the Warren Commission and a separate panel on other theories and tried not to draw any conclusions. So that's really, it was important to know how you were going to treat the Warren Commission because up to that point, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the commentators divided into the camps either endorsing the Warren Commission or opposing it. People wrote books basically in which uh, this would be another book endorsing the Warren Commission after reviewing all the evidence or yet another book uh, debunking the Warren Commission and criticizing it, and our exhibit wasn't designed really to be either one. So do you personally have any thoughts about what you think actually happened? Uh, it doesn't seem likely to me that one misguided loner um, in the only really well-organized and effective decision in his entire life uh, acted alone and killed the President of the United States. However, stranger things have happened in history, and history is full of odd coincidences and circumstances. And so until there is evidence that as a rational person I can respect, I have to accept at this point that we, we have no convincing evidence uh, of what other scenario may have happened. That's about as far as my limited research has taken me. I'm prepared to um, re retain my right to, to change my mind. I just haven't yet seen the evidence that persuades me that any of the conspiracies are more than coincidence um, and that they're, they're conclusive. And so what do you think the future holds for Dewey Plaza? Well, I still think there are some physical improvements that could be made that wouldn't, um, that wouldn't distort uh, history. Um, 
I don't think it has to be frozen uh, in time, the entire area. Um, on the corner of Elm and Houston, there's a steam vent that comes out of the ground and the sidewalk, and it's rusting, and it's no longer used for any purpose. And one of my first actions as county judge was to ask uh, to have that uh, metal, it's, a, it's a, a metal pipe, comes out of the ground about six or eight feet right in the busiest part of the sidewalk where all the tourists are. And I said, okay, someone give me a report. What will it take to go cut that, that pipe off at the ground and cover it over with concrete and have the sidewalk be more effective? They came back and said, oh, no, all the, all the historical experts would like us to not make any changes unless they're absolutely necessary. I want to leave the old street signs, I want to leave the old street lights, and that particular metal pole was in a lot of the photographs uh, that day, and therefore they want to leave that metal post right where it was. That to me is uh, unnecessary, and, and so I, I think the, the Dealey Plaza area can, can still be made to function better for the tourists on the sidewalk. Probably long term there need to be better places to eat and and other places in the area. that The area needs to develop, but it just needs to know what that core is going to look like and to protect the things that are important. Well, I forgot to ask you, did it surprise you that people like put down an X in the, in, in the street and that they underlined the allegedly on the plaque that says, you know, that Oswald allegedly shot from this building and it's scraped under the No, I think that's kind of fun. I mean, you know, people are not sheep. I mean, they're, they're not supposed to go to these sites and assume that all the historians before them have the last word. Uh, everyone who writes a paper or book in history is usually trying to change or refine the conclusions of those who went before. So why not the tourist in America? If we're a free country, you're free to have your opinion. Now, if they rip the sign off the wall, I, I would object. But just the fact that they've scratched under the word allegedly, I've always thought was, was kind of fun. And do you think that tourists will still be coming here like this 